Hello everyone and welcome to Career Talk. I am Suren Sharma, an agile consultant based in Netherlands, and today I am thrilled to introduce Stephen Wolper, a professional Scrum trainer and the author of the book The Scrum Anti Pattern Guide. So, friends, in this series, we will cover scenario-based, behavioral-based, and must-know Scrum Master interview questions. And friends, before we start, make sure to subscribe for more such informative sessions. And if you find the content valuable, which I am sure you will, so don't forget to hit that like button. So without further delay, let's dive in. So welcome, Stefan. Thank you oh. for giving your time. Thanks a lot for having me. It's a great pleasure. And it's my first interview this year. So I'm really <laughs> powered up, so to speak. Thank you. Um, Stefan, though, everyone knows about you. But still, if you want to just uh, share you know, anything about you in a, in a brief, so that will be great. Sure. Um... As many in our industry, um, I did not choose Scrum, but Scrum chose me a long time ago. So I was working for a little startup and the developers asked me whether they would like to become their Scrum master. And I thought to myself, how hard can this be? And uh, I've been doing that ever since uh, for almost oh, 18 years or so by now. Uh, and um, five years ago, I thought, hey, you're, you're writing so many blog posts and, and other things. Uh, why not uh, take this um, educational part a bit more serious? And um, I was talking to Dave West of Scrum.org and uh, well, I became a trainer, I think in 2019. Yeah, probably. And um, since then I've been uh, training new people in the fine that's, art of Scrum. That's that's great one, good to know. Okay, so if you allow, uh, shall we start the q and Sure. Okay. So, uh, okay, so very first one is, uh, especially for Scrum Masters who are just new. So let's say if you're a Scrum Master, so how do you prepare the kickoff uh, transition to a Scrum? So let's say if you are already into a waterfall or if you want to kick off to transition to a Scrum. So what is your take on that, uh, Stephen? Well, first of all, I would always invest in time understanding why Scrum might be an alternative to the way of working you've practiced before. There must be a reason for that. Typically we say, okay, it's uh, something in a complex environment. We do not exactly what we have to deliver to make our customers happy. We, we need to find this out. However, you know, we don't want to plan six, 12 months ahead and then uh, hope for the best, <laughs> you know? So we, we actually want to um, figure out what is worth building without betting the farm on 23. And that's, that's always a good approach. Okay. Um, it would be great if you could create alignment among all participants, uh, not just team internally, but also among your stakeholders that you changing gear here and that you try to do things differently. Um, what you certainly have to take into consideration is that you can't switch it on. You know, it's a process. It, it, it takes some time before you get familiar with that. So rule of thumb three, four, five sprints for a good team. Uh, it'll take any time to actually figure out, okay, how, how, how do the mechanics work here? I mean, Scrum is not rocket science, you know, so it's, it's, it has a short manual. <laughs> um, but anyway, you need to, need to get comfortable with all these situations. So for example, in my experience, not everyone is excited about the idea to accept more responsibility. You always have people who say, hey, I come at nine o'clock in the morning, I take an hour lunch break, I leave at six, and this is it. I trade my time for your paycheck. And in the meantime, you can tell me what I have to do, which is totally fine. You know, they have other interests, family, friends, hobbies, whatnot. You know, um, is, will that work in the long run with Scrum? I, I don't know. Give it a try and see how it works out. Some people warm up uh, over the course of the time. They really start to appreciate uh, the new opportunities Scrum is providing. Others say, no, I don't like this way of working. And it's just stressful. So um, I, I would take it slowly, particularly if in a larger organization. Um, ensure that your first team or first two teams or so are really volunteers. <laughs> you, you can't press gang uh, any, anyone into those teams. It doesn't work. Um, and um, support your stakeholders. Um, help them understand uh, what, what is going to be different and how they can uh, integrate themselves in the whole process, um, how they can contribute to the success of the Scrum teams. 
this is really critical and you need to reach out to, to your stakeholders as early as possible at least in my experience that makes a lot of sense this could be short training sessions little workshops you know um, help them understand how the team is working ask them okay what do you need from us uh, to to understand what we are doing um and um, then you have a, a whole bag of things that you can actually do uh, for example the classic is always we don't write reports here we, we do scrum right we have a sprint review and if you like to know what's going on you know please attend the sprint review Okay, from a dogmatic point of view, that certainly is correct, right? Um, the question is always very, whether that's really helpful in the context of creating trust among your stakeholders and uh, you know, helping the organization understand what you're doing there. So uh, if for a transitional period of time, you continue sending some sort of report at the end of the sprint, my God, so be it, you know, um, it's, it's not a big thing. So a lot of different aspects. I would really focus on, <clears throat> on two things mainly. A, uh, figure out how you can collaborate as a team internally. You know? So um, how, how can we, provided you are a team already, I mean, otherwise take into consideration it will take time to create a team. You know, Think of Tuckman and, and the, the stages that are still quite valuable in that respect to understand what is going on there. And secondly, think about, okay, how you can um, include your stakeholders in the whole process. And then start, do so, observe what is happening, uh, what are the things that go well, and what are things that uh, need some improvement. Great, uh, Stephen. Great. So I have uh, one more uh, follow-up question on this. So what do you suggest uh, a newly formed Scrum team work on first? So when the team just started, so any any uh, suggestions uh, on that? Team internally, um, I would always start with a working agreement, and uh, my second choice would always be a definition of done. Um, both are not supposed to be the final document, you know, um, set in stone and somehow displayed on on the team wall or uh, team room walls or something like that. You just get to start somewhere. And uh, I think this is a good idea. So start with a working agreement. Uh, how shall we as a team work? What does it mean? You know, um, What does refinement mean? How often do we have this? Who is participating? You know, All these little details that you have. And of course, definition of done. You know, the, the quality standard that you need to create transparency. And uh, also, please uh, consider that you have to uh, explain this uh, quality standard to your stakeholders as well. No. Um, and thirdly, I would consider thinking about the uh, the financial aspects of this whole work. Um, so my my experience has always been very helpful if the team actually understands uh, how much the team costs, for example. You will really notice that uh, teams are taking different kind of uh, decisions once they understand what an hour of the team costs. You know, if you know, okay, we're, we're thinking here $2,000 or something like that for the next hour, you probably think twice about doing that. Um, treat your team members as adults, as professionals, and uh, help them to bring the best of them to the, to the whole endeavor. And uh, transparency needs to apply there too. Thanks, uh, Stephen, for that. Okay, so the next one is again... Uh, most asked, uh, I think, uh, question that how would you measure the success of a Scrum Master? Oh, that's a simple one. Um, if your team constantly delivers valuable increments, you're a good Scrum Master. You know, Scrum is a team sport. It's like like football or soccer uh, or uh, hockey, you know, so cricket. Um, the team wins, the team loses. And... Um, Think of the scrum master as a sign of team manager, team coach, depending on or trainer, depending on 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 where you are on on this big globe, um, and uh, they will exactly regard you in this way. If your team is successful, uh, you will be regarded as successful too. And if your team is not successful, they will all look at you. Okay, what's going on here? You know why why is that, why is this not not happening uh, as we expect it to happen? And uh, you should ask the, the question yourself, right? So, hmm, it's not working. How may I have contributed to the current situation? 
You know, what have I overlooked? Were there any signs that things are going wrong? You know, um, where, where where did I let my team down? For example, very very common uh, things. And success comes in in a lot of different manifestations. You know, so for example, people are not leaving the team. On the contrary, there are other people who would like to join the team. You know, always a good sign that the team is successful. Um, your stakeholders stop breathing down your neck. You know, uh, because you deliver regularly. You um, manage to the uh, to uh, uh, live up to your commitments, and uh, they all highly appreciate that. You know, they they, they stop uh, annoying you with some sort of arbitrary deadline, something like that. Um, the team can work without you. I mean, there's this this crazy idea that as a scrum master you can't go on holiday. This is absolutely bonkers. You know? so of course, it's, uh, you should be able to leave for a sprint, and they should be working as usual. Um, of course, it is more difficult, for example, if you insist on facilitating everything for the team, right? If you're more the, uh, if you have more a, a clerk role for the team or something like that. Uh, so um, <clears throat> that's not a good sign. But yeah. Otherwise... So, yeah, you you gave me a, a very interesting question. That uh, what are the few anti patterns uh, that might a scrum master fall during a sprint? Uh, I think you just mentioned about one that every time he should be available. Like this is like mm -hmm. again one of the misconceptions. But what are the other uh, anti patterns which you think are there? Uh, yeah. I think the, the worst ones are really interfering with the flow of the team. I mean, teams are self-managing and uh, there's no need to patronize uh, professionals and what they're doing. You know, please, uh, it's uh, you're, you're, we're all grown up here. We, we know what we have to deliver and uh, just go for it. So interrupting flow could be the internal flow, you know, by... Um, um, facilitating events, uh, enforcing events, you know, so the, the daily scrum enforcer, for example, <laughs> uh, that comes to mind. And it's also disrupting the flow from the from the outside by not intervening when stakeholders actually um, um, distract the team from uh, accomplishing the sprint goal. So those are really uh, not that, that pleasant. Um, <laughs> another one that uh, I would consider to be really nasty is uh, not supporting struggling developers. That certainly is uh, ranking high on my list. Um, you need to observe very carefully, okay, um, does someone need help? And if so, um, how can I help that individual? And uh, the, the point is not everyone is outspoken. You know, the more introvert people are, the less they are openly asking for help. You know, there's uh, some people who have, uh, have no trouble asking for help. You know, hey, I'm, I'm, I'm stuck here. Could someone uh, uh, join me and we do some, some type of programming here or something like that? Totally fine. Others will just try to solve the problem because they believe it's their job to solve the problem. And for whatever reason, they're not asking for help. You know, th that is really a critical thing that you understand, okay, who might fall into the latter category, you know? And then, of course, you can't address them and say, hey, you need help. Uh, how, can I, how can I help you? <laughs> but you slowly but steadily need to signal, okay, uh, if you need help, I'm here to help, you know, and uh, then hopefully uh, make it happen. Huh? So those would be my, uh, my, my, uh, yeah. my classic issues. Thank you. So I just want to uh, take this further, this anti-pattern thing. So can you also uh, share some light uh, of few anti patterns which you might have seen, uh, especially with the new Scrum Master during the sprint retrospective. So, oh my God, there are so many. You know, um, of course, you start with not not having a retrospective. You know, for whatever reason, you know, you use the retrospective time as a dispensable buffer. You know, you need to finish a few things, and you believe that skipping an hour or ninety minutes of a retrospective will buy you this time, which is of course typically really nonsense. Um, you rush it, um, or you have these Groundhog Day retrospectives. You all the time you look at these confluence templates, and then you what was good, what was bad, uh, how can we improve? You know, people get bored to death by by that one uh, very quickly. Um, while retrospectives are team uh, exercises in the first place, 
um, you should consider inviting, uh, provided everyone agrees, uh, your stakeholders to retrospectives too. Have a stakeholder retrospective from time to time. No, so I don't know, every three, four sprints or something like that. Really helpful. Now, if you include them all the time, um, you create your little team bubble, and this is this is really not a good idea. No? Um, so that certainly would be would be problematic. Um, the team picks unsmart action items. You know, they're ambitious, they would like to get better at what they do, and they identified a few things that they want to change, but unfortunately, none of those uh, things is under their control. <laughs> you know, so as a scrum master, I would expect you to, to step in, probably, and say, I have you considered uh, that you might not be able to do this? You know, so um, problematic uh, could be as well. Um, no documentation. I mean, yes, uh, uh, working software or comprehensive documentation, absolutely. But it doesn't mean that we're not taking notes regarding our retrospective, you know, because I uh, actually want to have a little archive over time so that we can better understand, okay, what, on, on what kind of path did the team progress? You know, what, what were they talking about in the past? Uh, what action items did they that they chose, uh, did they choose, and uh, how were they dealing with those action items? Did they deliver? You know, there's this, there's this moment when the team is really great at picking action items, never to follow up on them. <laughs> so this um, classic issue as well, um, forcing people to participate. I think this is a really mean one. You know, so um, if you if you enforce participation in any event. Uh, it's it's a bad sign, seriously, um, because the event should be worth anyone's time, and they should uh, should be looking forward to participating in the event. You know, if that's not the case, it's really troublesome. You know, could be a, a lack of psychological safety. You know, people don't feel safe in your events and don't want to attend them because uh, otherwise they probably have to say about something. You know. Or the other team members are pressuring uh, uh, their teammates to participate. So uh, conformity in that in that classic sense. Uh, um, there's no clear purpose for the retrospective besides it's mentioned in the Scrum Guide as the last event that you have at the end of a sprint. Or, uh, not a good idea either. Or maybe there are unresolved conflicts. You know, you fail to resolve a conflict uh, between two team members, and now you force them to participate in the retrospective. This is probably also not a kind idea. So, um, classic, classic issues um, uh, for a lot of uh, young uh, scrum masters. What else? Blame game. You know, people starting pointing the fingers at each other, yelling at each other. Oh, this, this, this is bad. Really, really bad. <laughs> you know, so uh, this is uh, not a good idea. Um, your line managers insist on attending and you do nothing about it. I mean, seriously, I, I believe it's a good idea that your line managers should attend from time to time, you know, uh, uh, upon invitation. Um, but if they attend all the time, it's certainly not a good idea. You know, so because you need to have some safe space where you can talk about things that probably are not meant for the ears of your line manager. Huh? So those would be really, really classic, classic issues that you have within uh, Retro. um, retrospectives. An advanced one um, is when you, I mean, one of my favorite anti-patterns regarding retrospectives, you have reporting structures within the Scrum team. So if you have a senior and a junior developing on the same team, and the junior is reporting to the senior. You know, this is a really, really, really tricky situation. You know, because you can actually not expect that the junior is openly voicing their opinion, you know, because the senior is sitting at the same table and deciding how their career is actually progressing. And uh, probably they won't be thrilled to hear a few of these uh, mentionings of uh, the junior, right? Absolutely. Okay. Uh, that's great, uh, Stephen. You have covered a lot of things. <laughs> okay. Uh, let's move on. So again, uh, this question is most asked that uh, say your scrum team is uh, failing to meet their commitment, you know, uh, consistently mm -hmm. over the period of time. 
and their uh, velocity is volatile like like this zigzag so what might be the possible reasons and most importantly how as a scrum master you can address mm -hmm. uh, this issue with your team i wouldn't be concerned about volatile velocity that, that's that's uh, the nature of this thing um so I, I wouldn't be concerned about that one not meeting commitments okay we would need to have a dig uh, dig a bit deeper here what what the reason for these might be well, um for example, it is a junior scrum team, you know, they've been together for two weeks or something like that, or two sprints, um, then I wouldn't be surprised at all. You know, of course, uh, we would like to to see a development toward um, please um, um, invest a bit more time in picking the correct uh, um, sprint goals that you actually can deliver because we need to regularly meet our commitments to build trust with our stakeholders. Because uh, building trust with our stakeholders is essential to actually um, be successful as a scrum team. Um, when they're constantly failing this, um, there are many reasons for that. Um, for example, do they have all the skills necessary to actually accomplish what they're trying to to um, what they're trying to accomplish? Um, is it the case of that there are you know too optimistic? Okay, I would say. Uh, this happens in, in the very early phases of a new scrum team, but uh, typically, you know, it's uh, it's uh, it's um, leveling itself out uh, in, in a few sprints, right? But if this constantly happening, okay, maybe there is something that we should uh, analyze and and uh, talk about here. Why is this? Is someone pushing them to actually overcommit to something? You know, is it pressure from from the stakeholder or the management? You know, so is there is there actually a, a good alignment between the organization and the team? You know, are we really all pulling in the same direction here? Why is that happening? Um, do we have a weak uh, product owner who um, is saying yes to 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 whatever is thrown uh, at them? You know, so um, do we change our do we change our, our ideas about what is most valuable for the upcoming sprint uh, on short-termishly and uh, frequently? You know, um, are the people pushing work into our sprint backlog while we are working on this without consulting with the developers? So a lot of different reasons why this is happening, and you really need to understand why this is the reason. It could be something personal. You know, the two or three people do not get along with each other. You know, there's maybe a, a, an unresolved conflict going on and people simply do not cooperate. You know, so there's maybe two factions who say, okay, uh, it's us or them. So long, long, long list of possible issues. And as a scrum master, you re really need to understand what is going on there and uh, more importantly, how you can help your team to get out of this, this dire situation. Because by all means, um, we want to regularly deliver our sprint goals. That's the best way to build trust among stakeholders. Absolutely. Okay, uh, that's great. Thank you, Stephen. Okay, so uh, the next one is on matrices. And I am sure that in all the interviews, this is like a, one of the questions which is definitely going to be asked. So as a Scrum Master, what qualitative agile matrices would you consider tracking or monitoring and Stephen, you can take your time. You can describe on matrices mm -hmm. as long as possible. I am good. Please go ahead. Yeah, thank you. Um, so there, there are quite a set of metrics I really, I really like, and um, uh, I always try to sell them to my teams. You know, uh, it's of course, not my decision. It's a, it's a team decision. What kind of metrics you pick to figure out? Okay, are we on the right track as a team? Um, but. Uh, I like to start with some sort of self-assessment. Um, it could be something that's uh, as simple as the Scrum checklist from Henrik Nieberg. You know, it could be something that you create yourself. Um, it could be um, something more professional, like uh, Christian Pervis and uh, Barry Overeem's uh, application for that purpose. You know, so uh, endless opportunities to actually figure this out. And of course, there always is the opportunity to understand, okay, maybe we can do ourselves uh, a self-assessment here. You know, what would we consider to be a good sign that we are on the right track? And then you come up with your own metrics. 
um, very simple. So I would really put a lot of uh, time into, into figuring out, okay, how can we self-assess that we are on the right track as a team? And also, this is uh, really helpful. Um, and um, what I also like to do is, for example, um, I'm a big advocate of, of running surveys, anonymous surveys uh, among the team members uh, at the end of the sprint. You know, figuring out, um, okay, how how was this current sprint that we're talking about perceived? You know, and um, there are a few things that come to mind. So, for example, um, what I like to do, I like to ask uh, these classic uh, NPS start <laughs> questions, you know. So, um, how would you consider the customer value we delivered the sprint from zero to 10? You know, yes, we know NPS has a lot of flaws and problems, but um, uh, it also has a lot of advantages. It's so simple. Everyone understands how it works. And more importantly, if you collect those uh, answers uh, over time, um, you have a quite good understanding what actually is going on. And even better, um, you get a better understanding um, how patterns are changing over time. And you may discover trends uh, before they actually manifest themselves in real life. So if you, for example, coming back to customer value delivered during the sprint, um, if you see a decline, a slow, a slow but steady decline over the last three, four, five sprints, um, this is really, really a question of concern from my perspective. Okay, what is going on here? What, what, what are the issues that we are facing here? Um, is it a technical nature? Is it, is it, is it uh, something at the organizational level? Is it something at the team level? Um, is it a people issue? You know, okay, I mean, if you're in the middle of an of a, a influenza pandemic, uh, of course, you will see for a few weeks that uh, performance is dropping. Yes, because people get sick. Um, but otherwise, um, what are possible reasons for that? There must be a reason for that. And that is your job as a scrum master. Collecting the data just helps you to figure out what is going on. And um, I like to stress uh, anonymous polls is the important part here. You know, so you don't want anyone feeling um, um, the, the, the need to uh, actually uh, voice their opinion. You know, so anonymous polls are really, really great at that. Um, what else um, do I like to ask in these kind of surveys? For example, um, the technical health of our platform. You know, how is that one? You know, um, are we accumulating more technical debt? Um, uh, is the quality of our platform shrinking? And uh, is this a pattern or is it an individual situation? What I do like also is asking for a simple employer NPS so to score, so to speak. So it's the idea of, um, hey, if you um, imagine there is a there's a position in our organization for uh, someone with an agile mindset, would you recommend this open position to a good friend of yours? Very powerful, you know. So, um, very powerful, really, really helpful in my experience. And of course, you can take this a step further. So my uh, uh, my last question is, Shavi, always is. Um, from a professional perspective, is this uh, is this the time of your life, or are you already looking for a new job? And you would be surprised how openly people answer this. Uh, so, and if they're telling you, "Okay, I'm looking for a new job," it, it, it's it's really already late in the game. You know, you, um, then then some things already have developed to a point where you say, "Ooh, maybe uh, we should get a bit more serious about this here." So those uh, classic uh, classic surveys are, are really, really helpful. Um, what you also can do at this level is, for example, um, ask about Scrum values. You know, how are we living Scrum values? Again, on a Likert scale from, I don't know, zero to six or something like that. Um, how would you say that we are that we are living Scrum values? And the great thing is you can, all, of course, all visualize these, these the, the results from these surveys. And um, to help you with uh, understanding, okay, what 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 is going on here? Where are we moving? What is happening? Um, how is our trend uh, materializing here? And more importantly, if you couple this with a 
personal diary as a scrum master, then you actually can probably even align certain events from the past with the changing pattern that you have here. So that's, uh, I find very interesting as well. And of course, there are a few, few classic uh, flow metrics that are always helpful, lead time, cycle time, for example. Um, maybe you also consider um, um, bucks that escape to production, for example. Or, I mean, there's an endless amount of, of metrics that you can have from, from the delivery side. You know, um, so DevOps is a, is a fruitful field for that one. Pick the ones that are interesting to you. And of course, you, you can also uh, branch out into um, evidence-based management, for example. So Scrum.org um, has this, this uh, idea of uh, providing metrics for teams to understand where, whether they are on, on track, delivering value for everyone. And uh, there are, I think, almost 30 metrics that you can pick from. So there is more, more metrics available than, than you actually want. And of course, there are there are bad metrics. You know? so, um, I would consider velocity a bad metric because it's per se volatile. It's not comparable from team to team. It's highly dependent on the team composition. And it's really, really problematic. And um, it's okay as an internal metric, fine uh, for the team. Uh, but the moment you lift it up to... Um, to, to the organizational level, it actually loses all its uh, all its uh, fanciness. You know, it's it's really um, really problematic, and uh, it, it's really not uh, not helpful. And by the way, uh, uh, you may have heard of the Hawthorne effect, which act exactly describes this effect. You know, if you incentivize an increasing velocity uh, on a sprint by sprint basis, you will get one. You know, rest assured, humans are good at this. You know, we figure out a lot of things. And actually, um, I, I often run this little exercise um, in my classes, um, asking my students, okay, um, imagine your manager believes that a successful Scrum team increases uh, its velocity uh, regularly. Um, how can you, what can you do to report back to your manager increasing velocity without working more? Huh? And uh, you, would, you wouldn't believe uh, how, how creative people are. <laughs> um, and everyone knows how to game how to game this game and um, yet in some organizations it's, uh, it seems to be uh, still an important part of it um, and of course there are really really ugly metrics you know like like uh, story points per developer per, per, per time interval or something along that line you know this, this is horrible it's uh, very close to lines of code written or something like that. And um, if, you, if you're already walking in that vicinity, it's, it's just a small step and you're somewhere around stack ranking or something like that. And this is nightmarish. You know? uh, I certainly don't want to be involved in an organization that is, that, that is practicing that. Okay. I think you have covered everything, <laughs> Stephen. Thank you for that. Okay. Uh, let's move on. So... This question is yeah, a little tricky. So let's say your your team stakeholders are passive. They are not engaged at your sprint review. So what can the team can do to engage with their stakeholders uh, during the sprint review, Stephen? Well, first of all, um, there, there, there's a, I mean, try to understand why they are disengaged. Um, maybe there's a misalignment of interests. Right. Um, so what you are talking about in the sprint review does not uh, does not directly um, align with their interests or responsibilities. Uh, so um, it's for them. It's uh, they, they're basically forced to participate. You know. So okay. Um, why why do you expect me to actively participate in something I don't believe has any value to me? Um, uh, maybe in the past their contribution did not have any kind of visible impact. Uh, so they were just recorded and said, yeah, okay, and nothing happened. You know, So you do the two, two or three times, and after that you probably say to yourself, okay, I'm wasting my time here. Um, there might be, some people might feel intimidated in larger groups to voice their opinion or point to things that they are actually interested in. 
you know, very closely related to, to a lack of trust. You know? So um, because they really don't know, okay, how that would uh, would be understood you know, by everyone else uh, sitting in that review. Um, maybe they just fail to prepare themselves for this whole thing. You know? So that they're the, the present, but at the same time, they're, they're not, right? Um, and it's always this question of, okay, how, how is the team actually communicating during the, 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 the sprint review? I mean, some teams uh, kill people with PowerPoint. I fully understand that people say, okay, ah, seriously, I don't have any, any, ah, this is highly annoying. Let me get out of here as soon as possible, right? Um, please do not ask any questions because that will prolong the sprint review and I'm hating it already. Um, so that is certainly an issue. I mean, if you flip it upside down, if you run a science fair, for example, or if the stakeholders drive the discovery of the new things, it may have a complete different different dynamic here. Right? And this is also the, the what I would always uh, suggest to deal with that. You know, using that performance. Science fair is great. You know, um, let them discover everything. Let them let the stakeholders take over the helm. You know, it's. Uh, it's, it's really helpful. Like, ask direct questions. You, know, you can't expect that the, the silent ones are you know, reading your mind. <laughs> you know, how are they supposed to know? Ask them if you want to like to know something. Um, break the big discussions down into smaller groups. You know, and each of the groups um, addresses different topics of the, uh, of the uh, issues. Um, maybe you can use a simple, simple feedback tool like Mentimeter. You know, just uh, feel the pulse. What is going on here? You know, how do you like this feature? Is, is it meeting your expectations? It's so easy to say, click, you know. And um, maybe you just uh, are also more generous with uh, with acknowledging and appreciate uh, um, stakeholder input. You know, if uh, people if people have the feeling, okay, my contribution is valued and I'm changing things here, they will be more interested in participating at a later stage. Don't expect that to happen if there is no feedback from you. Absolutely. Yeah. Wonderful. Yeah. Thank you, Stephen, for that. Okay. Uh, next one is pretty interesting. And uh, honestly, like, yeah, I'm not seeing <laughs> this kind of question so far. So the question is that the developer, uh, one of your developer increased the sprint scope by adding some additional items into the product backlog. So we have a specific term for that, which we call it gold plating. So mm -hmm. uh, during the sprint review, the product owner is surprised that something which uh, he has not asked is already there. So what can you do when uh, faced with this uh, gold plating uh, or scope stretching kind of scenarios uh, in your team? I, I think it, this is a like, very unique situation. Maybe oh. someone want to impress <laughs> um, the person or product owner. I don't know. As always, there's a reason for this. Uh, let me share a little story. Uh, so um, almost uh, 18 years ago, 17 years ago, um, we were working on a, on a startup here in Berlin. And uh, we had really good developers. And uh, we thought that... Uh, Open ID at the time, a brand new way of uh, you know um, helping people to register for applications so would be an excellent way of uh, um, pushing the uh, adoption rate of our application. And so um, our really senior developer, Pshemek, started working on that. And um, we thought, okay, maybe it's two days or something like that. You know, it shouldn't take more. And he took the whole two weeks of the sprint. And we were really curious what was happening here. <laughs> um, turned out he um, did not just uh, implement OpenID as a sign up and login uh, way uh, mechanism, but he also created a complete OpenID management system in the background. So as a user, you could uh, manage multiple OpenIDs. <laughs> and uh, we said, hmm, okay, maybe that's a bit too much here. <laughs> and, uh, but uh, I was asking myself, okay, uh, when did I fail Pshemek? Uh, because uh, apparently he was convinced that, uh, that we needed some sort of management system for open IDs, for multiple open IDs. 
while everyone else was believing that uh, we get uh, a simple system, you know, quick and dirty, give it a try and see if it's appreciated. And if uh, if it is, maybe we can do something else here. <laughs> um, but that was uh, unexpected and uh, unexpected in the sense that uh, there was a lack of communication. You know, we should have spent more time refining the whole exercise. You know, and again, it's, uh, let me put it this way, uh, assumption-based building of product elements. You know, you believe that the other ones uh, all understand and share your opinion on what to do and how to proceed and what shall be done. And um, this is a tricky thing, by all means. Um, sometimes it's, uh, it's as simple as that. Um, then there are, of course, the moments when uh, when it develops, just have some fun <laughs> doing stuff. You know, um, you come back Monday morning and you uh, are surprised that the loading time of the homepage uh, is a uh, second longer than it used to be on Friday. And uh, you try to understand what's going on here. And you figure out that uh, your your most senior developer over, over uh, the weekend uh, integrated a third JavaScript framework, a brand new JavaScript framework, because you wanted to see how it works in a real life environment. <laughs> you know, I said, okay. Good. Maybe we should talk about that too, right? Um, so uh, coming back to my my uh, to my idea earlier that uh, people should know what the whole operation, for example, costs. Uh, that is certainly one element of helping everyone understand. Okay, let's let's uh, act as adults here, um, because every sprint we make a significant investment decision. It's not about the direct cost that we spent. Uh, it's also the opportunity cost because we could have built something different in the meantime. You know? And um, what you want is that you um, help your teammates to come to a level that they fully embrace this responsibility. Guys, we really make a lot of investment decisions here. Uh, they need to, need to uh, earn a return on investment. And if we're not doing that, something is wrong here. Right, this is really, really helpful. And uh, in my experience, the moment you move the conversation at that level, uh, these unexpected gold plating incidents uh, really um, become less frequent. Um, otherwise, um, life will be boring without them, right? Mm -hmm. So why not be surprised about a little thing uh, now and then? It shouldn't be the regular approach, though. Absolutely. Okay. Uh, nice pers uh, perspective. Thank you, Stephen. Okay, so the next one is, uh, again, uh, the developers are insist on showing some undone work to the stakeholder. So what do you think? Uh, how do you deal with this kind of situation? Do you think it's it's okay or it's not okay? Or what's, what's your take on that? First of all, I would try to understand why they are doing this. Okay, so, for so they example, are telling, for example, they are telling that okay, uh, we should be transparent. So even if we don't have you know, not finished the work, transparency is a, is, a, is a good point. Absolutely, you know. So um, it's it's a, it's a good way to communicate the team's progress, um, particularly in a in a complex environment or when the team is facing significant challenges. So nothing wrong with that, um, particularly if you, if you need feedback, right from your from your uh, stakeholders. You know, okay, we're almost done here. Um, this is how it looks. Um, uh, do you still believe that this is the best way to proceed? You know, are we still all aligned here? Because uh, next sprint we will be done here. Um, it's also helpful for stakeholders to understand um, the difficulties uh, that the team encountered during the sprint. I mean, um, we, we should be transparent about this too. You know, hey, we are really, really having trouble at this corner of the of the application because it's a it's significantly more expensive and uh, exhausting than we expected before. And these are the reasons A, B, C, D. Right. Um, it's good for setting expectations. You know, if you if you show what's going on uh, early in the process, um, you you provide your stakeholders with an idea what's in the pipeline and where problems might be and how those problems might affect their own work. You know, I mean, uh, people are typically waiting for us to provide them with some sort of solution 
uh, that they need to actually uh, accomplish their own goals. It's building trust. You know, we're transparent about this. We're not hiding anything. You know, the, you may have heard of this, this idea of the watermelon project, you know, it looks green on the outside, but deep red on the inside. You know, we don't want that, right? <clears throat> and it's, uh, I mean, if you show an undone work, it's, it's an invitation to collaboration. Assistance, you're asking for expertise of your stakeholders, um, which could be really, really helpful to build rapport with your stakeholders. So there are a lot of reasons why showing undone work may be a good idea. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm uh, deliberately uh, formulating this uh, in, in a bit vague form because um, if this is becoming the habit, you know, you're, you're overburdening your stakeholders. You know, they're certainly not interested in learning in meticulous detail every two weeks for six hours what you're working on. You know, this is not their job. You know, so be very careful uh, when you choose to actually be transparent about what you work. I mean, there could be also a simple reason for that. Imagine that you picked uh, Scrum for creating uh, a product increment that uh, will take more than one sprint. You know, so something uh, machine learning related or uh, uh, large language model or something like that. You, you won't get that done in, in, in two or four weeks. It's simply not working. You know, so maybe you want to talk about this or also... <laughs> Um, particularly an organization where you are under the impression that your stakeholders still believe you are a black box as a team. So if, yeah. you, if you're lacking a bit of uh, transparency on that side, it might be a good idea to carefully dose uh, uh, the, the um, information about undone work. So I would really talk with the team about this and before the, the, the sprint review so that we're not overwhelming our stakeholders yet at the other side provide uh, some further insight so that I have a better understanding. Guys, we're not ripping you off. We're working on your stuff. Um, this is how it looks like, you know? Um, so from my perspective, showing undone work is not always uh, an anti-pattern. You know, so it really depends on the context, uh, on the product that you're working on, on the organization, how the organization is communicating, what kind of culture this is. I mean, if you if you really have a shoot from the hip culture, you know, uh, immediately get active and get something done, um, it will be tricky for a team to actually uh, keep interest alive for two or three months because they're working on something really big here. Uh, so classic problem in a lot of startups, in my experience. Okay, uh, I think we are good for today. Uh, Stephen, we have covered a lot of questions. I think uh, close to nine or 10 questions we have covered. So I think we are good. So thank you, friend, for uh, joining us uh, for today's session. And we hope you found this session helpful and informative. And if you enjoyed this session, please don't forget to like and subscribe to our channel. And we hope to see you in our next session. So bye and th thank you, Stephen, one more time. Thank you, Zulam.